Hello friends and welcome to the Montessori Mission. Today, this is episode eight and I have with me the great pleasure of Tatenda Blessing Mucheriri, who is a powerful uh, Afro Montessorian uh, advocate um, in the US. He was born and raised in uh, Zimbabwe and he has an incredible story of how Montessori found him. And we were just speaking about it, how it just gave him this great big, um explosion from the universe of this is the gift of this is what you need to do um and that happened when uh tatenda was in beijing traveling he was there for a film festival and um you'd spent some time hadn't you in london at university and that hadn't quite worked out for you and then you'd gone traveling is that right and then um uh you're doing literary arts and then when you came to beijing from what we, you'd said, you uh, had the opportunity to go inside a Montessori classroom, and then the trajectory of your life was uh, was was completely changed. And then after this period in in Beijing, I believe you said it was seven years in uh, in Beijing, and then in 2014, Tatenda um, came to the US, uh, and uh, he's now in Colorado. And when he came to the US, he had this amazing realization that there was infant and toddler training for Montessori, uh, not just CASA. So he dove into infant and toddler first, and then CASA. And here he is um, as a, a leading light for, for um, Afro Montessori, as I said, advocate. He has some uh, incredible NGO that he's working on, a uh, project that he's working on at the moment, which I hope he's going to tell us about as well. And um, I'm so thrilled for him to be here with us today um, for another view, another perspective for the Montessori mission. Um, 10 questions, 10 Montessorians, um, 10 perspectives from 10 communities. Tatenda, thank you so much for being with me today. Um, I'm really, really thrilled you um, would like to come on and tell us your story. It's going to be really fun. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just so humbled that you were able to connect and uh, make time to uh, share our Montessori experiences and insights. So I'm really excited to be in community with you uh, today. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. So I think um, for any of you who haven't heard your story, I think we need to hear the Beijing story is so awesome. Um, would you mind just talking us through how, how Montessori gave you this big blast from the universe of what uh, this was your path? Yeah, it's interesting that she start with that question because, you know, I was actually even thinking about it today as I was preparing myself to be, you know, in this space with you, uh, just reflecting back to uh, 2008, no, nine in Beijing, uh, when I was there for a film festival and how I sort of by, you know, like a weird chance that I was invited to uh, audit a Montessori class. Um, which was something very uh, strange to me because I had no idea what Montessori was then that time. Um, I was just a boy from Zimbabwe in China trying to even learn one or two uh, words in Chinese to be able to communicate. And here I was being invited you know, uh, to a school to audit uh, something that I had had about ever in my um, 20 years of life that time. Um, so I was invited to a Montessori school uh, to audit uh, because um, this person that I'd met at the festival um, had had a chance to um, sort of see my work that I had done in Zimbabwe with young children, yeah. uh, with education, health and well-being and uh, wellness. So um, he thought that I might have a unique perspective into just education and young children. So. Then I was invited uh, because of that. Um, so um, I sat there for uh, what felt like two hours um, in the morning observing uh, a Montessori classroom, being so surprised <laughs> with <laughs> what is this in this world that I am seeing, um, you know, coming from Zimbabwe, where I'd grown up and gone through the sort of like strict uh, British um, uh, appetite um, education system that had me sit on a desk and uh, look at the teacher on the blackboard and like learn in that way. And here I was in Beijing uh, where I could barely see the teacher in the classroom 
and uh, these uh, young children were just busy uh, doing different works and um, really asking the teacher for help. And uh, I don't know, something just felt strange. And so it was just full of surprises, uh, those two hours. And um, I remember though vividly, like one thing though that stood up for me was just how, even though this was so different for me, uh, it took me back to my uh, early years uh, back home, like how I'd grown up with my five big brothers and friends and uh, neighbors and how everything really felt organic and a reminder of how I had grown up in Zimbabwe. And I was just convinced that this might be what I'm searching. You know, I was 20, so it could be that also in that time, honestly, you were like trying to figure out like what you want to do with your life. And um, yeah, and I said yes to uh, learning more about Mara. Sorry, I remember calling my mom saying that I think I might have found uh, a job. I want to try teaching. And she said, yeah, go for it. I've always known you to be a teacher, which was also, again, strange and surprising that she thought that I uh, could teach. And um, yeah, so that's how I literally uh, discovered Montessori uh, with that uniqueness of uh, being in Beijing and being invited and everything just aligning with who I was with this new thing that I then was exposed to, which I had grown up with not knowing that that was Marasari, but on the other side of the world, it had a name that was called Marasari. Um, yeah. Wow, I love that story. I think that is the best um, discovery of Montessori story ever. As you say, you're in a completely different culture, just trying to learn, you know, the odd word here and there um, for a completely different reason, and then to take something that that then takes you on your, you know, your life's work and your life's purpose and legacy. I think that's just amazing. I, I love it. It's, it's really beautiful. Yeah, um, I'm still just surprised with how I even myself find myself in a Montessori classroom then, and I'm still in a Montessori classroom. I'm more empowered with that experience. Yeah, that's really, that's so true, isn't it? The empowerment that, um, we give to children, but it, for us, it just changes us so much, doesn't it? it um, and Nusaiba from uh, Rumi Montessori, she said that it helps us become more of the person we want to be, like in episode three, that really stuck with me, she her saying that. Um, and it's, uh, that just really resonates. It's just, it's really wonderful. But also as a 20 year old, that's amazing that you felt that flash of inspiration, right? You know, 20 is quite, yeah mature to be going okay yeah this is what I want to do and then you know right. forging ahead with that yeah I think it speaks to what you're just trying to explain here about empowerment with also you know conversation that you had with uh, Romy Manasari on third episode um it did gave me a clear definition of what empowerment is that it is something that's in you and that light that power that you have and you experience something that's able to ignite what you already have that you didn't know that I had this power I had this with me uh within me and um yeah so that moment was just a game changer for me it gave meaning to what I wanted to do with my life with what I believed in education with what I was thinking about education so Manasori did ignite that fire in me like hey you have this this is it so i was able to see myself um through that uh observation that i had that day in beijing wow that's incredible i feel really emotional actually hearing you speak i haven't even asked the first question i'm crying already <laughs> and it's mana sorry does that to us huh yeah <laughs> It really does, doesn't it? Okay, let's start with the um, the 10 questions. And thank you so much for sharing the Beijing story. It's just awesome. Um, so the first question for episode eight of the Montessori mission, please, is uh, what does Montessori mean to you, Tatenda? Wow, gosh, <laughs> what does Montessori mean to me? You know, um, I think it just means potential, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it means... Uh, potential to what education can be if done well. It has that in itself that um, we can 
change the way we think about uh, how children should learn, how children learn best, and how we should be able to facilitate uh, environments of learning for young children or for children uh, in general. Uh, it has that potential to change the way we think about um, families as, you know, as partners more than just engaging them uh, uh, in our um, ways of uh, teaching through a Montessori method. Um, with Montessori, I think I have experienced um, a way of thinking about how to partner with parents and uh, affirming them as the child's first teacher that they do have wisdom, they do know how their child learns and being able to then take that and hold that sacred as we guide with what we know through a Montessori mm -hmm. a method, how they learn. It also has the potential to just, uh, you know, honor communities, you know, cultures, mm -hmm. if done well in different places where I was in Beijing, you know, and um, I saw it in a way that it was done culturally relevant in, uh, in Beijing. And yet in that being from Zimbabwe, I saw myself as well in ways in which um, I was honored uh, and my childhood was in front of me. So I think it has this potential where uh, with the right adults, you know, working in this um, uh, system, we're able to uh, innovate uh, education. Wow. I love that. I love what you said. It's um, honoring that it's sacred, the, uh, that the parents have their wisdom, their inner wisdom, and we must hold that sacred whilst we guide their children. I, I love that. Yeah, because often many times we don't really think about parents as yeah. also very knowledgeable about their child, because yeah. we think that, you know, we've been trained, so yeah, we, we know it, yeah. Already, <laughs> right? Yeah, and which is somehow uh, not true, because, you know, we are trained to be able to partner with parents and be able to have the language and the framework and the resources to, you know, engage and partner with parents. So I like that, that it has that potential for us to welcome the parents as we welcome the children as well it feels as if that's been the huge shift actually in the past 10 years actually that it's more about parent enrichment now so i um trained in 2011 uh, mci in london and and at the beginning of my montessori journey I, there wasn't much I guess, as you said, the sacredness, obviously that was the, the relationship with the parents is important, but it feels now that everything is more ensuring this continuity between this congruence between the home and the school in environment, the, the classroom environment, so that we can work together as collaborators with, with the parents and the families, as well as we do with the children. Yeah, it feels, do you feel in your experience has been a shift as well with your experience oh. in the States? Absolutely. I think there's uh, a shift and I can speak more to also like my experience in the United States where there's that move to, uh, you know, think education through a racial lens or through a gender mm -hmm. lens. So with that comes, you know, some of the stuff that we really also need to uh, be mindful of. Uh, which, you know, again, are the parents, right? Like if we're mm -hmm. able to serve the child, we then really have to um, have healthy relationship with the parents. Mm -hmm. So um, I've seen the shift uh, even in my own training where it was very heavy on materials and mm -hmm. giving lessons, not so much about, you know, you know, partnering with the parents or the knowledge of the child through the parents' experiences. Um, so I think it is moving in a- Yeah, no, it's really exciting and really positive. And going back to what you said um, in, in Beijing, I love that when you said that you felt that it was culturally relevant, but they were sensitive to your culture as well. And um, there's that brilliant quote in Inside Montessori, that great film, isn't it? That children need a mirror and a window in the classroom. And that resonates so deeply. And that's so beautiful that you felt honored and respected, but you felt the children's culture was honored and respected and revered as well. That's, that is true Montessori, isn't it? In, that indeed. Is really what what she had that was the vision yeah 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 it just and i think you said very well i don't know if i can even say it more i think being able to have the children experience this richness of you know who they are is you know it's been visible in the environment and the adults were in the environment too also 
feeling a very strong sense of being seen and honored because we we forget the adults you know in many spaces it's all about you know we have to save the children we have to be able to guide the learning but what about the adults who are also doing the work are they being affirmed are they being seen do they see themselves as well in you know in this uh learning so um yeah it, it was it was magical in a very spiritual way my encounter with marasori in beijing and i i cannot even say anything without reflecting back to that day uh with what i'm doing with what i want to do like how everything yeah. in that moment you know it felt like the marasori light shined in front of me yeah. that is so powerful it's amazing yeah <laughs> Um, and as we spoke about when we had our chat a couple of days ago, um, when we were preparing for this, um, as you said, the 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 feeling and the the legacy of Montessori is what's really important, and the values, not just her as a name, and we smack a name on it and like a label on it rather, um, and we must be careful that we're staying really true to to her values and her vision not just playing lip service to the to the name um that's our challenge isn't it indeed it is yeah i think it takes you know even though we talk about the aware adult right in Montessori, i think it really takes that awareness of that adult who's really aware of who was maria Montessori, right like just more than the stories we are told or we read but like looking into a web what even brought her to what now we call Montessori, and then really trying to live through in some of those um uh, principles and question some of those that we can do better so yeah 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 most definitely yeah it's it has to be about our growth as, as well yeah. yeah for sure okay thank you so question two please tatenda is what was your first light bulb moment on your montessori path i mean it's got to be beijing right <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it was beijing and i think uh to be more specific was just the the level of independence that was a uh, part to the freedom that was you know very vivid in that classroom for me um i again you know i just thought of myself you know that day back in zimbabwe just being outside with my friends with my brothers just living so free and and just like running around climbing trees playing in the dirt and just mm -hmm. having that freedom and being able to do you know uh what a three-year-old or two-year-old you know whatever that time was um and i think to me that was that changed everything the way i think about education like maybe it is about independence are they able to do things that we uh want them to uh learn and and also just thinking about not what we want them to learn but uh what they want to learn then what we have to guide I don't know if that makes sense. I think that independent and freedom was just like a game changer for me in the way we think about education, that children will learn if they're independent, if they're able to do what they're supposed to do or what they want to do. And knowing that they can do that. Yeah, definitely. It takes such a deep level of trust as us <laughs> as adults, isn't it? I mean, mainly trust in ourselves and then trust the child. As you say, when we, we must, guide them to learn what they want to learn and then know that we can then once we've got their trust and we've helped them with their needs then we can guide them to if there is something else that, that has to be learned at that time but it has to be them that um that is the priority not our agenda it has to be their agenda and it's so hard you know as an educator as a parent you know really it's uh, even with training, you know, it's, it takes it is time, hard. doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's really, really hard, yeah. That's not how we think about <laughs> education. Our definition of education is about having somebody teach you things that you don't know that you have to know, not really trusting that we have. I think I listened to one of your podcasts where you were talking about the inner I think with uh, with Barbara Isaac, when you're talking about the, you know, uh, the, that we have the inner teacher, you know, within us, the child has the inner teacher, right? Um, so they know what they want to learn. So it is us adults, you know, being able to know what is it that they tell us that they want to learn, and then we, you know, provide an environment where they can yeah. learn. Um, yeah. yeah, trust. Yeah, trust uh, is a big one. Yeah, it's a really. But as we, if we weren't trusted in childhood ourselves, you know, then 
that's a really, really big deal for us uh, as adults. Uh, and, and it's really interesting that you've um, spoken so much of your childhood in that sense of uh, freedom, because when I spoke to um, Prudence at uh, Mama Helen Montessori in, um, in Lagos, uh, she's episode nine of the podcast series, she said the same. Her childhood was outside, freedom with her brothers and sisters, big family, loads of friends, everyone doing their thing. If they needed like anything, they would come back home, grab it and then go out again. And I, and I feel as if in Western society, we've just lost that so much for our children, the freedom to go out even because of fears, because the world's so busy, because we're all working so much harder, you know, as we, we don't have, I mean, the circumstances that, you know, we don't have the time to let our children go and play for like three hours outside because we've got to work and what have you, there, there isn't the time. Um, so that sense of freedom that you, um, speak of from your childhood it's i guess that's a question how can we give that back in in modern western society um and it has to be i guess within the classroom because that's where children have to be so how can we give them more freedom within the classroom that allows them to to do what they need to do it will take a lot of work because i think some of it yeah, has to do with trust like do we trust that they can just go outside and be and you know be able to take care of themselves and i also think of some of my cultural shock you know as i interacted with the western culture when i moved uh, to the united states was just the amount of things that are considered risky or like dangerous or like not safe for young children i'm like oh my so, that's my whole childhood, right? You yeah. know, if you say they cannot do this, um, yeah. they're not able to learn to do it when they yeah. cannot even have access to doing this, you know. Um, so I think uh, being able to trust that it's safe outside, right? Uh, and that, you know, I, I had a, a friend who would tell me that there's a reason why they're called toddlers. They toddlers. They 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 fall. You know, they they do all these things. They they're not gonna break, right? I mean, I mean, there are some limits for sure, but um, we are very hands on to an extent that we sometimes hinder some of that uh, adventure for our children, that exploration for them, some of that muscle growth that they really need. Yeah. You know to climb the tree when they're able to you know yeah. uh run around like barefoot and feel the ad yeah. like some of those things so um i i think western cultures need to learn from indigenous cultures they really need to do some Absolutely, deep yeah. listening and and just like be willing to learn like we need to trust because i feel like there's so much uh lack of trust um yeah, yeah. But I think it, it's a bigger question of trust in society, like we don't really trust our organizations, you know, people have been let down by governments and organizations, we think about the, 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 the turmoil in the US that we saw last year, I mean it's understandable people don't trust, <laughs> because yeah. there isn't respect there, um, you know, and so I think it, it comes from up high and then it just filters down, don't we, we, we feel like we can't trust anyone because big companies aren't looking after us they're looking after their profits and governments aren't supporting us or the police or whoever you know it's really it's we've got to find it i guess within <laughs> but then that's another whole spiritual growth isn't it too oh um, absolutely yeah. yeah and it's so strange too that we don't we don't trust the system that the system has failed us you know and um you know we know that and one thing too that i've been very uh sort of like shocked um, in the past years to realize within the education systems uh, here, and I think pretty much uh, everywhere anyways, um, how we sort of have outsourced education um, of our children to you know schools where we trust the schools, we want the schools to be able to get my child to university, get my child to high school. Um, and I think if anything, we need to reclaim parents have to reclaim their children so that they can own their children, they can own the experiences and the learning of their children. And then, then we have that partnership with them as teachers mm -hmm. on how can we then create spaces, environments uh, that are fully invested in how children learn, how children should learn and, um, and be. So um, I, 
I, I'm always, you know, thinking on how to do it when on the other side, the systems have failed us. And at the same time, we also have given our kids uh, to schools, to teachers, to be able to make them read, make them uh, write when <laughs> we also need to claim our children and have that home and school um, uh, school experience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the it's the the teacher training itself. You know the way that a teacher is taught in the mainstream system, or even in the Montessori system, how they're taught to teach. You know, from coming from that, a teacher is taught a child is a a bucket to be filled, right? So when we're there coming from that, it's it's understandable that um, the teachers don't have the skills that they need to support children because they're not even being trained in a way that helps them support children so yeah it's um it's really interesting it's a big topic hey a yeah. big topic. <laughs> uh let's move on um to question three um so in what ways does montessori enrich the work that you do um so i'm the work that i do currently and uh that i've been doing anyways is just like um rethinking education, you know, in ways that it uh, works for um, for Black children, for Black families, uh, for African, African immigrants. Um, and I've tried to really stay within my own experience so that I can really understand it from, you know, yeah. where I came from, where I am and who I am, and people who might have the same experiences or shared experiences or prior experiences. So with Montessori, I think it has in itself some of the ways in which we can use or which are very much aligned culturally to how we think about young children how they should learn um and it gives me a framework of when i then talk to um, um my black families and uh and people i just tell them like hey look this is the story of our people when we're doing yeah. mass, sorry, this is us. This is the thing that we've been doing pre-colonization. Yeah. You know, before the white settlers came, our forefathers, our grandfathers, our people, this is how they knew that kids would learn if their bodies are moving, if their bodies yeah. are engaged, if their hands are like, you know, having that sensory um, yeah. experience with the object or with anything that they have. So um, I think Montessori is really, it really is giving me some of those um, um, insights into which uh, it can really be for anyone and um, and everyone if it is relevant to who they are and their lived experiences. Yeah, so true and so powerful, as you say. The wisdom was there. The wisdom. Yeah. The wisdom has been there for thousands of years and we've made it super complicated, but we don't, it doesn't need to be that complicated. And as you said about everything starts with movement. Um, uh, I heard a great um, lecture all about how movement um, is the start of all cognition. Unless there is movement in the first five, six years, then the, the pathways haven't been laid for the, the higher levels of the brain that's probably not the right way to say it but the, the higher levels of the brain in order for cognition and all the academic learning to come later so um as you say that's that was instinctively known that children need to move and explore and do scary things um when they're little and get broken arms and legs and all of those things you know falling out of trees i mean it's so scary yeah. as a parent but it's part of it isn't it it's really yeah. no one wants their child to bash their head or whatever but it's it's such a uh, a learning process for children to be able to understand their limits and things like that but it's really hard for western parents i think to let go i know which is um very um interesting to me because i believe that that they will not do things that they cannot do you know that they're not ready to do um yeah like climbing, they will never climb up high if they cannot. So I think there's always that too, which, you know, as a teacher that I've always uh, practiced that I don't help, um, I didn't help my children in the playground when they have to do, you know, climb a structure or yeah. do them keep bars. If they're not yet ready for that, if they cannot do it themselves, 
I'm not going to help them. Yeah. So I think there's also so that like, once they have the muscles built for that, they'll do it. But if they're not yet, that's when then it's dangerous then because somebody has helped them on that top. Now they yeah. can't go back and then they yeah. try and they fall. Yeah. And thinking about movement, as you were uh, talking about, you know, this lecture, uh, it, it made me think about, you know, talk about light, uh, light bulb moments in Marasori when I took my infant and toddler training here in Denver, Colorado. We had um, one of our instructors who came and talked about movement um, and she talked so much about natural birth, how kids who were uh, conceived through natural birth, because they had that movement, they were able to push themselves and the mom is, you know, as they walk on um, yeah. the world, they, the movement are very well coordinated or they have the muscles that some of uh, like myself who was a premature baby and c-section that I had to really learn some of those movements and have my muscles you know aligned so it just speaks so much to the importance of movement prenatal and postnatal like you know as the baby moves um so yeah movement I think it's very linked to how young children should um learn yeah it's really um, interesting you mentioned that about cesarean babies. So my, my daughter was born first, she was cesarean, and then my son was natural afterwards. But because I, I did my assistance to infancy training in, uh, in Cape Town, just outside Cape Town in Stellenbosch, when I was pregnant with Olivia, my daughter, and then she was cesarean. And I, as you said, like in the training, I was so um, mindful that because she had been cesarean, that I need to just facilitate movement so much. And there were so many things that potentially could have uh, affected her, you know, things like, you know, everything like breastfeeding and movement and like, mm. there's, so there's like um, gastro um, stuff, which is more like breathing, asthma. There's so many things that are linked to having a cesarean baby, aren't there? And that I just tried to do everything I knew from my training to, um, to make sure that I could support her in the best way. Um, and she's super strong, almost seven year old now. So I think I, we got the movement. I don't know about anything else, but I think I got the movement right. She's really good at climbing trees now. So it's uh, awesome. but, it's just, yeah. it, but as you say, the um, this is information that parents don't know. It's not necessarily freely available, you know, to know that you know there was that medical decision that had to be taken at that time. But we we must as parents do our best to take steps to rectify isn't the right word, but you know what I mean? Make sure we can support our, our, our child, you know, in the next, as they, as they grow. Yeah. To make the, yeah. make the most of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so question four um, is a really awesome one as a little insight at the beginning of your Montessori journey. So um, question four is what, when was the first time a child taught you something about yourself? that you didn't know already? So either from an observation or a direct interaction, when was the first time a child taught you something about yourself you didn't know? Yeah, gosh, you know, the, <laughs> I can think <laughs> many, many uh, moments <laughs> where I'm always learning from them about myself. Uh, but I think back to one of my, uh, my all time favorite was, um, I think, I don't know, I, it's, it's a funny story, but it's also like very rich in uh, the way I think of that interaction that I had with um, uh, uh, one of my um, uh, my kid in my classroom uh, here in uh, uh, in Denver, Boulder. Um, so this was almost like a three year old, um, and uh, she's been learning how to use the bathroom. Um, you know, like we were working on it. Um, and again, uh, you know, Western cultures, they tend to not party train quick or worry sometimes when that doesn't happen, when it's supposed to happen, when the school needed to happen. Um, and I've, you know, I, I was just like very gentle and easy and trust in the process that, you know, it's going to happen. And i yeah. um, more interested in just like, um, you know, we need to use the bathroom. This is where you go when your body needs to empty itself, uh, you know, that language. Um, and then one day she just like, we were outside in the playground. She ran inside um, to use the bathroom and she came back and she's like, 
hey, Mr. Tate. That time they used to call me Tate, not Tatanda. And so there, there are two things in it. So like I said, it was like very compound. Um, hey, Mr. Tate, I pooped for you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like outside during yeah. like pickup time. So their parents come in to pick their kids, their kids play in the playground. And she was so proud that she had pooped yeah. for me. I couldn't help myself laugh. I'm like, how many times, <laughs> you know, do you hear somebody saying that they've done this yeah. for you? Um, yeah. But I, uh, it, you know, it, again, it, it really, to me, uh, gave me an insight into some of the work that I do that I maybe not aware of, like uh, the role as teachers that we, you know, we play. Because sometimes we don't know if they really remember us, you know, when they go home or they remember the work that we do. Uh, so I think, I knew then that I, I had so much to do as a teacher more than just teach. Cause I think we get lost in like teaching again, like lessons, but so much of those uh, social, physical, mm -hmm. you know, growth that they need that we aid and facilitate. Um, and yeah, it's, it was just like a, a changing moment for me, the way that I think about, uh, toilet awareness and uh, partner with parents and children as we you know yeah. help them to that independence um but yeah it just like changed the way I think of myself and the way I think of myself as a teacher definitely yeah, yeah. I love that it's just so not about the materials is it the materials is such a tiny part like what we give them in self-confidence and as you say you know body autonomy and body awareness like that yeah. is yeah Amazing. And so um, moving to more recent times, when was the last time a child taught you something about yourself that you didn't know? Um, I, 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 I don't know. I don't want to talk about the recent one, but I want to talk about the risk in the recent years. Uh, yeah. I think of it like five years ago, um, if not four. Um, so uh, I used to go by Tate, you know, when I came to the United States, I thought that was cool. I thought that was easy and, and, and short and, you know, and neat. Um, you know, I would introduce myself as my name is Tate, you know, kids would call me Mr. Tate. And, um, and, and I'll be talking, you know, introduce myself as Tatenda, but not to, the, uh, not to the children in my classroom. And one day this child comes and say, um, uh, you are Tatenda, you are my African teacher. So there were two things. One, she could say my name Tatenda, which was like, wow, okay, why am I not teaching them to say Tatenda? You know, mm -hmm. they can say Tatenda. And uh, also her saying that you're my African teacher, it brought me back again to uh, who am I as a teacher? You know, cause I then, you know, like you said, I went and I took my uh, infant and toddler training and I took my three to six training in the United States. And after that, I, became a Montessori teacher and so much of myself, you know, the way that I thought of myself as I worked in the schools was really just this teacher who was trained in Montessori and not so much about myself as an African. like Honoring how yourself, I, yeah, and honoring your cultural heritage, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it brought me back to so many things that I've been doing so wrong, honestly. Like, I remember during, uh, you know, the month of February when we had to do Peacemakers and I was asked to, you know, talk about, you know, Nelson Mandela, talk about Martin Luther King and being so proud to, you know, be able to share those stories uh, with the kids and forgetting myself for in my like I am that black person that they interact yeah. with every day they need to hear yeah. my story they need to learn about my family we have very beautiful stories that I can share with them yeah. so um it really made me really own my um my African identity you know which I mean I know it's a big you know identity to say but my Zimbabwean identity yeah. and show up as an African Montessori teacher who is sharing the story of Montessori through my uh, my experiences the way I had seen it in Beijing that afternoon. Um, yeah. So yeah, it it was interesting how like they see ourselves, yeah. you know, they see us, and we just don't the think. Crazy, that hey, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> That's really powerful. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and they need the they the children need the as we said at the beginning they need this this mirror, don't they? They need to see people like them. 
yeah. and they need to see their guide honoring their cultural heritage, regardless of where we're from. They they need us to yeah. to be authentic, be like the most authentic we can we can be, because that gives them permission to be authentic they just know don't they if we're not being incongruent then they're like they're going to sniff it oh. out there is nothing like a young child to they sniff know. out inauthenticity <laughs> yeah they know uh yeah it's um it's really interesting uh, episode six which has been released this week is um from aziza osman and she uh is a powerful voice for montessori here in the arab world and she's a uh, syrian but but grew up in the in the netherlands and she um, she had a moment of realization when she would speak Arabic at home uh, with her daughter, you know, in the family. But when she goes outside of the home, she speaks in English. And she was like, yeah, that takes her back to her childhood in the Netherlands, feeling ashamed of being an Arab and feeling ashamed of being Arabic and not celebrating that feeling that in Europe she had to hide her Arabness, as it were. And she was then transferring um, that to her young daughter who's almost two years old and she was like that was my like light bulb moment of like I'm not honoring my my heritage and proud of being an Arab it's really and as you say like with the little girl that did that for you it's just wow, wow. okay <laughs> they're showing us they just shine a light on where we need to grow eh? <laughs> you know and I can relate to that you know being an immigrant and a person who have lived in different you know uh, uh parts of the world in different cultures you tend to hide some parts of yourself uh for the fear of you know, being othered or like, you know, being identified as not somebody from that uh, particular place. And I remember myself when I was an assistant teacher not wanting to talk because I sort of knew that if I started talking, they would then pick, you know, like, oh yeah, he's not from here. You know, he sounds different. He should be, you know, from somewhere else. And um, so I just sort of like resorted to being quiet and just doing, you know, the cleaning, and um, not so much like being more active in like um, being part of the gathering time, be it the line time or um, interacting more with the parents or with the children. And it took me sort of, you know, ways of reflecting on myself and how I want to show up and honor myself that it was a gift for them being able to uh, hear English in a different accent, knowing that they are training themselves to then listen to everyone or communicate with everyone knowing that it's not um this linear way of just you know hearing people who have the same accent as theirs but like people from around the world speaking english in different accents so i then gave them that gift of being that teacher who has a different accent from their mom it's an accent from you know their uncle or you no know, whoever they interact with um yeah but yeah so powerful yeah what a gift okay so question six i think is the trickiest one of the ten um when was the last time a child caught you out of integrity and questioned you on it wow um you know it was a funny one again i, I always think anything with young children is always funny you know they they have a way to make it not too mm -hmm. serious because by just mm -hmm. them being young kids yeah been cute, just tell it like it is adorable right um but then you know like oh my gosh <laughs> you know i've been caught here um i i remember you know doing a birthday celebration and um it was just like within the first four weeks of school so we were still trying to identify you know uh things in the environment and naming the works that we have um on the shelves and um and then here we are you know having to do our first birthday celebration in october and i had the globe um and i uh i'd given the um you know the tour around the class you know uh, with the kids and i think i'd labeled it uh, as a globe and um and then we're doing a birthday celebration and i'm telling them that okay so our friend is holding the earth because uh, I wanted to teach them the idea of uh, the earth having to go around the sun yeah. uh, as we were celebrating the birthday. And I had uh, identified this as a globe as when we did the tour. Mm -hmm. So so I didn't have that language for them in that moment. And this little boy said, 
Uh oh, no, that is a glob. Uh, and I said, yeah, you're right. But so it made me think about, you know, uh, just the idea of being consistent, you know, like well, when you said this, why are you changing this to this now, yes. right? Like in that moment, I think it wasn't um, necessary for me to teach that lesson when I had not yet introduced to them the idea of the sun and the earth going around. Um, but again, in a way, it was his way of saying, like, you taught us that this is a glob, you know, the same way you said with the geometric solid. So yeah. why now you're saying this is the earth, you know, like the idea of earth and in a glob was not yet something that they yeah. uh, can comprehend. So um, it just made me think about consistency in the way that I you know, I teach some of the things in the way then I have to do something with that background to like, okay, yeah. we talked about the globe, this is the shape, but this is representing the earth. Like I had mm -hmm. not had that uh, language with them. Yeah. So, um, it was just a quick check. <laughs> like, yeah. hey. That's a really, really good example. Yeah, we, um, it, we, we've got to start with the concrete, haven't we? And we can't just throw, throw things in. It's that meeting the child where they are all, all the time. Um, but it's hard. You know, you've got a class of 20, 30 children and just mm -hmm. getting ourselves into that flow of, okay, let's meet them where they are, meet every child individually where they are. Yeah, no, yeah. I love that story. And so how did you explain um, yourself to do the little boy? Did you then take a backtrack or was it did it all just sort of flow naturally after that i think i was able to in that moment to recognize that yes you're right it is a club. yes i did say that this is a club right and i did very quickly say i uh, in this moment we're gonna have this represent earth you know the planet earth where we live um but um I, I kind of had to do uh self uh uh check on myself um after the you know the event uh, that well I, I question a lot of you know in that moment like um, should I even celebrate a birthday when I haven't yet introduced the idea of uh, you know the earth you know the yeah planet. that's an like, interesting question yeah yeah uh, and even just celebrating the birthday like uh, how can I do it in a way that they really can understand or start learning some of this concept mm -hmm. if I haven't yet introduced, you know, them. Because I think the globe, we normally introduce it when we're trying to introduce the continents and mm -hmm. we don't do that in the first four weeks of school. So, yeah. um, and yet we have some, you know, little ones who turn three in October who yeah. need celebrated. Yeah. Uh, but um, I was able to acknowledge that, yes, you're right. This is a globe and yeah. this, particular time as we are celebrating our friend's birthday we're going to use this to represent the earth um and i think it was it, it also helped that he was into just you know the space knowing that the earth you know so mm -hmm. uh, i don't know if he in that moment knew uh what i meant but again we didn't really have a, uh, a conversation since we were celebrating the friend's birthday but um no, it's great. It's us remembering that the context is so important for children. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah, yeah. understand that. That's great. Um, and so question eight is um, a really tricky one because this is probably the answer to this is going to be, you know, at least hundreds of different favorite Dr. Montessori quotes. So what is your favorite Dr. Montessori quote right now <laughs> in this present guess, moment? Right? I'm so much into culture and uh, you know, equity and stuff. I think I like... Uh, how I interpret the words when she talked about, um, uh, you know, the richness of uh, of the world, yeah. um, and that the needs of mankind are universal. You know, our ways in which we meet and create that for the children to relish in that is what's more of our work. So um, I really like when she talks about diversity of the earth and how we should. Um, sort of like expose or give that to the children so that they really relish in that richness. Um, yeah, I, I just love it that that's our work. If we're able to start from, you know, from whatever we introduced to them as being so diverse so that they understand the idea of uh, diversity of difference and um, before we introduce other bigger uh, questions or 
uh, things that they need to learn. Yeah, you're right, Dan. D it, diversity is the is the foundation. So then it's not something that they're removed from later on. If we're mm -hmm. giving them one example of the model way things should be, then we're always playing catch up afterwards, aren't we? Like, oh, and other right. people do this. But actually, if we just, as you said, teach it as, as a whole from the beginning, as, as uh, mm -hmm. the wholeness of the world and then the different cultures within it, then we then don't have to do any unpicking later on of, of, uh, of then the weirdness that the education system takes us and actually dominant society takes us. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. You know, I think of myself when I was teaching uh, toddlers that it was very unique. Like, I think I shared with you uh, when we, you know, had a chance to catch up before this, that I was the first in every school being, you know, a male teacher, an African male teacher, yeah. working with, you know, toddlers or infants. And it was something that was unique when it wasn't supposed to be unique. Like, why yeah. are we being surprised that there's a man working with young children. Mm -hmm. So it's just that like, we don't really intentionally prepare environments where we expose our children to mm -hmm. different um, uh, people who identify differently, be it male, female, be it transgender, be it mm -hmm. gay, be it, you know, so that we're not surprised when that happens. They know that, you know, these are all role models. These are the teachers, these are the adults, these are the people who were, uh in my early foundation for my learning so yeah yeah it's early childhood is so heavy on on women and it's just such a shame it's such such a shame and oh, i don't know how long it's going to take to to redress that 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 balance it's like because it's not a reflection of of life as you walk down the street hey you know why is there you know yeah. three four five women looking after you know children in early years when the world isn't like that um yeah it's it's yeah it's going to take time to redress but inspirational models like you and Sid I mean that's you know you're talking about that that realness of giving children real uh experiences that they can relate to of people um who are doing inspiring things in the world and yeah, you're here. You're going to make such a, you would have made such a difference in the foundation of children's lives and the children you've worked with. So yeah. it's beautiful. It is. Um, and so, Tatenda, for question nine, please, what is your deepest desire for Montessori in the future? In the future and also now. <laughs> I don't yeah. like the job of waiting. Right? Yeah. yeah, I always think like we always, you know, we, we love the job of waiting and use the word mm. the thing that we cannot do now or that we don't want to do now. So I think this yeah, is also right. now. We're also thinking about the future. Um, is um, I hope or I uh, or I wish we can have a global, you know, way of thinking about Marasari so that again it's not just um thought of as this very western or eurocentric you know uh, one thing that i did um last year during the pandemic you know when people were baking bread and doing all those recipes i had time to connect with um uh mainly immigrant uh families just to ask uh, about their experiences with uh education in the united states and uh in their countries of birth and uh their hopes for you know their children's education just trying to understand if they even know what Marasari um yeah. is and um which again i think i'll talk more about when i talk about what i'm working on right now because it was the foundation of how i then thought of like what i want to do now and put more my energy um was the idea of uh we, we share Montessori in a very Eurocentric, very Western way that then, you know, sort of like uh, seclude, you know, um, uh, our other, you know, uh, black families, brown families, you know, um, Asian families or, or, or people who are not white. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I really wish that Montessori can really be shared in a very diverse global uh, uh, way of interpreting uh, Montessori so that we are not leaving others outside of that story, outside of that education method. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, that is my hope that we really look at this as a framework that we were given to uh, see what can be possible if education is done well, if uh, children learn using their body, if they learn mm -hmm. using their senses, if we honor uh, their love of learning. Uh, and with that, there isn't anything Eurocentric with it, no. So I don't know why we can, we again, you know, get lost in, um, yeah. in, in making it very uh, Eurocentric or very Western yeah. or very Americanized, especially here now. It's, you know, I was reading about Montessori when it came to the United States and how then they, like, like they always do, make everything American. Um, yeah. Like for what, right? Just as a way to commercialize it and make it, you know, appear more, um, appeal more to the affluent, to people with money, people yeah. with access, when it's something that should be accessible with every, every family and every child, so yeah. You're right, inclusivity. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And so, what do you see is your role in achieving this desire? So that's question ten. What's your yeah. role in achieving it? I think you know, um, being able to um, honor myself, you know, my uh, my people, um, and reclaiming you know that for us um but as i mean you know um uh black people that this too is ours uh so if i had the opportunity to get trained which i still think is a privilege uh considering how much expensive it is and also the time that's not available to everybody um that i then have to bring it back and make it more accessible and um so I think I have a role to really reshare this and um, be able to uh, honor um, the spirit and the people and my people who are able to allow me to have the time to do this, allow me to follow my, my dream, my passion to get trained and bring that back to them that, okay, I was the one to gain access, now here it is so that we all have access to Montessori education. So that piece of advocate, but more than being an advocate, but really bringing it back. And um, I think we feel like, you know, in, in the Bible, for those who, you know, read the Bible and go to church, you know, the stories about the disciples that after Jesus shared some information with them, or parables, then they were taught to go and share that with, you know, yeah. with the world. So I think like, being one of those disciples in Montessori who has had the privilege to gain this access now, being able to go back and um, and share that with your community, with your people, with your family. Oh, that's beautiful. Going back and doing that at grassroots level, yeah, really. Yeah. Um, that that's social change, isn't it? That's really, that's really really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, as you said, it's a gift, you being one of these disciples and um, then taking it uh, to back to Zimbabwe. But as you said, all the wisdom is there. That's what's so amazing, the, the, the wisdom of the way you were raised and, and people raised in traditional cultures, you know, that the wisdom is there. It's just, um, I guess for you, integrating it in a way into as you said the very sort of old school strict british system is sort of bringing that in my i guess montessori is that bridge between the wisdom of of traditional culture and your cultural heritage with the old school system and montessori is that bridge that that can that can um find a path together with with that yeah yeah true i believe that you know people back home, they could use uh, other ways of thinking about education, how the children should be educated so that they just don't think that they have to pass that test to be able to proceed to uh, secondary school, then high school, then college, when sometimes they might be so gifted in ways that we don't know because they haven't been provided environment or they've had, had an adult who is so much invested in who they are personally before, uh, 
we can think about can they do the sounds can they write can they do addition can they do subtraction but who are they um um so yeah i really think that that's the work to um bring it back as an alternative to um ways in which you know we are taught to um send our kids to school and expect them to excel in life um yeah Beautiful. Thank you. So there are 10 questions complete, Tatenda. Thank you so much. And now I would love um, for you to share with uh, the audience um, what plans you you have, what you're working on now. I mentioned at the beginning your, your NGO you're setting up. Um, I'd love you to share everything and how they can, how people can support you, how people can learn more about you. Um, yeah, what what do you have in the pipeline? Guys, I'm working on this uh, passion project, <laughs> you know. Um, so like I said, last year, you know, when I was working um, to open a micro school here in Denver uh, through the Wildflower School uh, Foundation, I, I was doing a fellowship uh, through Moonshot uh, Adventures, which allowed me time to uh, stick to uh, families in the community, uh, Black families, brown families, immigrants, refugees, about their experiences with education and um, the awareness of uh, Montessori education as well. And my takeaways or my learnings were just that as Montessorians or as education uh, entrepreneurs, we often expect parents to enroll their kids in the school. That's always the idea that we share the information with the hope that then they go and enroll in that school in the neighborhood or in that school, you know, uh, down the street. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I, I think uh, in many, you know, situations we don't really think about access in terms of transportation, in, ter in terms of uh, affording the tuition that, you know, most Montessori schools really charge more. Yeah. Um, and if we're thinking about extending Montessori. Uh, to our black and brown uh, communities, um, we often don't think about that. When we think about it, we think about it in the terms of scholarship, like we're going to offer some scholarship, but when sometimes really they can't even afford those scholarships, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of pain, you know, or having their only black child be the scholarship kid in the classroom mm -hmm. with other white kids who have different experiences, you know, mm -hmm life and lived experiences uh, from them. So, um, in, I mean, in short, so I then uh, really thought of um, this uh, program that would then bring Montessori to them, to their homes, to their communities, to their churches, to their neighborhood, uh, you know, uh, to their streets. And, um, and I was in that, you know, experience, um, driving my car with the Montessori materials, going to visit them, showing them how, the Banyamia Cube and, you know, you know, all the stuff that we have in Montessori. And my main thing was to show them the materials and also then dissect what's in this material that's helping us, you know, uh, do counting with your child. That's helping us really learn, you know, uh, the sound of the letters. So it wasn't more about the materials, but like what else can we then do at home that that is more accessible other mm -hmm. than having you to buy, you know, the binomial cube or the triangles or the pink tower. Um, so I thought of this program that's called Montessori on Wheels. So literally getting a bus mm -hmm. and driving to their communities with you know, the Montessori materials so that they get that exposure. And also we then collaborate with the parents to think about what do we have at home? What do we have mm -hmm. uh, within us that can help us you know, to count? Because I can think of many things how I did count in Zimbabwe you know, at home. With my brothers without having to have the materials or a pen or a, a, a paper so um so i'm working on that i still in its very infant stage where we are building the team and um we have the bus but it's amazing going to be so um i'm excited to you know tag the bus to the communities and have the kids come in and uh have fun with it and then you know collaborate with the parents and really honor them as you know their child's first teacher and um thinking about ways in which we can honor what they know about their child um 
how they learn best and then mm -hmm. also taking it back to Zimbabwe in the sense of, you know, this is the model story that's on the move. So we also move uh, to the other side of the world mm -hmm. where we are hoping to learn from indigenous people and see if the ways in which we can bring some of that back to our um, BIPOC communities here that they can also enrich the ways we uh, think about learning. So yeah love so it Montessori on wheels it's such uh such interesting and beautiful project yeah I love it and and as you say it's offering um showing the parents uh the richness of the materials but helping them to see that they can create those experiences in their homes mm -hmm. um that's that's going to be so um powerful for parents to experience that and and um just the the shift as you say of like removing that privilege of of people having to live in a certain neighborhood or be in a certain income bracket to be able to get to a school but actually shifting that completely and going to people that need it i think is is hugely powerful yeah and also thinking about yeah. schools as homes like schools are yeah. not just a building where they have to go to yeah. but at home can be a school yeah. and also the idea of how we're deconstructing the school bus that school bus usually picks kids from home and to a school but in this case it's not even going anywhere it's coming to them and they're getting yeah. on, on the bus and then have school inside the bus and have fun inside the bus and then they get to you know um enjoy the bus so i think there's just so much deconstruction and decolonizing and honoring the parents as they realize that they they do this naturally, you know, and what we do in Montessori is just we have this materials helping us to do what they do at home naturally. Yeah. Yeah. So um what a vision. Yeah. Thank you so much for telling us that. And you'll keep us updated, okay? Once you've got it all set up, will you keep us updated? And then we can I can put all the links to that. Um sure, absolutely. We have a website, we have an Instagram page. So I it's, again it's still in you know in the process, but um it's up uh, on social media uh, as we just try to keep uh people in, um informed on ways in which we think of launching this next year in the spring and in the summer next year in the spring okay great so we'll put the links to that in uh in in the details um for the podcast tatenda thank you so much for joining me today thank um you. it's been such fun and i just um love again another another perspective of montessori in a different community and just the experience you had from Africa, then in Asia, and now in North America, it's just, I mean, that is Montessori right there <laughs> in the image of you, right? Like cultural enrichment right there. Yeah. Well, thank this you so much. You. Thank Sorry. you so much again for creating this platform where we get to um, share our voice and our experiences and, you know, our insights in the ways in which we're thinking about Montessori. So I think um, it's something that we often don't get right so i think you're providing something so beautiful to uh to the teachers to the community and um to everyone honestly so that it's just outside classroom knowledge that you also get to hear by mara sorry so thank you for this work thank you so much i'm so honored that you that you came on with me um today and um I think there's going to be more exciting things ahead. Um, I already got ideas of how we can work together. <laughs> yeah. In my head, yeah. Um, but thank you so much for joining me. And um, and this is uh, episode eight of the Montessori Mission, and this will be available on IGTV and YouTube and all of the podcast um, platforms. So thank you so much. Um, the Montessori Mission is ten questions. 10 Montessorians, 10 perspectives from 10 communities. And um, this has been Tatenda Blessing Muchiriri from originally from Zimbabwe and now in doing some beautiful work in Colorado. And thank you so much for joining me and have a beautiful day. And I'll see you again soon. Take care. Absolutely. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Thanks for watching. Thank you.